we're going live. Hello, hello everyone in Zoom land and Facebook land. Welcome back to the Science and Spirituality series of the Superhuman Summit. It is an absolute delight to have you all joining us online and across the airwaves. And um, the first two speakers have been amazing. It's been phenomenal already. And uh, like we knew it was always going to be, but it always is so mind blowing to have delicious humans from all over the world. And so we started off with someone in Queensland. We've just had someone in Hong Kong. And now I, we have beautiful Enrique Feldman. And I think you're in Tucson, aren't you? Yes, Arizona, yeah. Arizona, so in, in the desert area. So welcome to you all the way from Tucson. It is a delight to have you join us for the Superhuman Summit. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just, when, you, when I heard about and spoke to you about the, the words superhuman and summit in one phrase, I was all in uh, <laughs> because the, we, we have so much more that we don't know uh, than we know. And in that journey is uh, where we can find our superhuman self. Absolutely. Well, and that's what you're going to talk a bit about today. Um, and so today, um, Enrique is going to talk a bit about how to live with purpose and the awakening of the superhuman spirit, which as soon as um, we riffed a bit about what his topic might be, we were a definite yes, myself and my co-host, Michelle Crawford, who will be on the next one. You'll all get to see her smiley face real soon. Um, we both just went, yes, that's a definite. And so recently I had the pleasure earlier this year of interviewing you for my own podcast and show. And as soon as I did and our discussions about sound and music and brain games, um, your work as an educator and an author, the work you've done with your daughter and artistry and so many things. This man has very many complex bows and I don't know that we could easily um, give you a bio or a little profile because there is so much in that little kit bag you have, but I knew we had to have you on. And so welcome as our third speaker to talk a bit about this superhuman spirit and how do we awaken that within us? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's interesting when people uh, ask me what I do, I, I used to have a hard time answering that question years ago and I was still discovering my, to use today's term, superhuman self. Uh, and today though, over the years, I've realized I really do one thing. And I think we all do this thing at some level. And what, what, the way I word it is I'm a community builder. I build community. And that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean community, like right now you and I are building even more community. Mm -hmm. And now we're building community with others we know. But a question I think relevant to today's topic um, is do we build community with ourself? Do we commune enough with ourself? Um, do we look inwards? Do we ask uh, questions that in the end can help us optimize um, our relationship with our brain, our mind, and our body? Uh, my experiences, which have, I've been very fortunate to have been around incredible people of all ages, including some very young children and some very incredible elders and everything in between. And, and it's all about trying to thrive and, 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 um, find ways to be our best self. But, but in order to optimize that, for me anyway, my experiences have shown me that brain, mind, and body, we need to address those and really uh, consider not just the, the great concepts, but concrete actions we can take on a daily basis. Beautiful. And so that's a perfect segue, segue for a science and spirituality kind of summit where we are looking at the blending of two, the meeting of two, and everything comes back to that singularity or that unification and alignment. And I love that you're going to talk about our alignment within ourself because we often don't think about that too much. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, I have some imagery I'd like to share. Can I do that? Please do. Over to you. Share let's, away. Let's dive in because uh, I, I created a little, uh, well, a treat really for everybody. Can you see that clearly? We can, we certainly can, that looks great. Excellent, so uh, this is an image I love um, and I love it because it, 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 it reminds me of the word ignition, of the word ignite. 
and igniting something inside us that is authentic and profound and not just hoorah, rah, this boom, bow, which is cool. I'm, I'm, you know, motivation is an important thing, but we need to, and I encourage us all to find ways to sustain whatever it is, the excitement, the inspiration. We need to find ways to continue that and sustain it over time. Um, so what, what you're gonna see here is a, a journey that I've created for all of us. And at any moment in time, anyone can pop in with questions on Facebook or wherever you're at. Um, and, and so I, I, this will be very interactive uh, as you'll find out in a moment. <laughs> Physically. Yeah, so we'd love you to use the chat box if you're in Zoom, please use the chat box. And if you're in Facebook land, do the comments uh, below and I'll be monitoring those. So we'd love yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And, and just let me know of any questions. I'll be happy to address them I will. in the context of the moment. So this is my grandmother. This is my Nana. And this was a good hair day. And uh, my and uh, she was a very a woman of the earth. My, my Nana was half Yaki Indian. So with a name like Enrique Feldman, people quite often uh, wonder what what is that uh, and it's definitely you know we talk about uh, science and spirituality I, I, I run the gamut uh, <laughs> of background so I'm part Russian part Spanish uh, part Mexican I'm also part Argentinian and I'm also one Yaki. and my grandmother here uh, was the, the the source of that heritage and Yaki's were known as the dreamers very interestingly enough um, as in lucid dreaming and other forms of dreaming. So my Nana was a huge influence on me. And she would, um, early on, I didn't realize it, I was four or five, but early on, she would speak to me about the power of the mind. And so she'd be making a uh, picture of this. Uh, she'd be making tortillas, beans, rice, and little four-year-old, five-year-old Enrique was sitting at the table, kitchen table. And she'd stop, uh, all of a sudden stop, look right at me and say very seriously, everything you touch turns to gold. And then she'd go back to making tortillas. And I was like, wow, you know, I kind of got it, but I, I knew it was something positive. But over time, I realized what she was talking about was the ability to manifest, the ability wow. to create. And I, wow. that was my norm. I grew up with that. And I thought everyone grew up with that. Mm. And then I started teaching and connecting and, you know, running businesses and, and, and uh, performing and all the things that I do. And I realized that not everyone had that. And so it became a passion of mine to share that. The other thing she would say to me with a different kind of energy, she would get kind of closer to me and crouch down to be at my level. And she would say, mijito, my boy, mijito, everything in here can be out there. So I think about how grateful I am to have grown up with this woman I mean, I was raised primarily, I had a great dad, but I was raised primarily by my, my grandmother and my mom. And I, I'm very glad I was, because uh, they taught me about all sorts of things. So I could go on and on with my grandmother, but I bring this picture up just to set the stage before we are, we're about to have an experience together, a physical one. You're gonna need your arms and hands free and your fingers, uh, and you're gonna hear some music and we're gonna, we're gonna play. We're gonna play with our brains and we're gonna ignite our brains in a different way. So Yay! In, I love yeah. listening about your work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in, in order for us to really dig in and actually awaken the human spirit individually and, and, and for our society, right? So collectively and individually for that to happen, there are some pretty specific things that help um, speed up the momentum. One of them is creating a better brain. That's layman's terms. And I'm quoting people like um, David Sinclair, PhD, uh, the author of the book Lifespan. I'm quoting people like um, Daniel Siegel, MD of the book uh, Mindsight. Um, so th there's a, a huge mountain of research behind what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Today's not a research session, but I just want everyone watching to know that there, this is both research and evidence-based. It's also organic and fun. So here we go. So thank you, Nana. And just do what I do. Just do what I do. So we're gonna start with a simple brain game. I invented these back in 2001. And here we go, letter X, letter X. One, two, ready, and switch. Switch, 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 
And I hope you're doing well because these, this one is a three-year-old brain game. Okay, so I hope you really rocked it out because that's a three, four-year-old brain game. Let's go from that to a much more advanced brain game. Finger. So a finger like that, not here, but here. The thumb's not down, the thumb is in, and the other hand, a thumb straight up. And one, two, ready, and switch. Two, three, and switch. Two, pretty good, AJ. Switch, switch, switch. <laughs> switch, 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 switch. Wow, okay, so you got a little of this. It's okay, you did really well, AJ. I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Let's continue. Finger, I think you did old one. <laughs> Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to find out where perhaps some of you, and certainly AJ, I want to find out where AJ starts struggling because that's called the unknown. Right. And for us to awaken the human spirit, we cannot live in the known. We must live in the unknown. Here we go. Finger, thumb, now cross your arms, and switch the fingers there. AJ, you are above the cut. Okay, AJ, and everyone else. Hold it right here, hold it right here. You're gonna switch your fingers twice and your arms once. It looks like this. Switch, switch. Switch, switch. Oh. Switch, switch, pretty good, pretty good. Oh, now that's hard. Switch, switch. And if, you're, if that's still too easy for you, switch, switch, switch. And on and on and on. Let's go back to an easier one. Shoulder, elbow. And one, two, ready, and switch, switch, switch. Easy, much easier than the other one. Let's do another one that's more challenging. Ear, nose, two, ready, and switch. AJ, I'm impressed, switch. Most adults, I get this, I get this, yeah. I get all matter of options. I'm impressed with AJ. <laughs> and here, and here. Square, square, square. We're doing two squares. And now overlap the squares. This is still pretty easy. Overlapping the squares. Hand right here, square. Hand right here, triangle. Two, ready, and triangle and square at the same time. <laughs> now, if you really want to make it devilishly hard, you cross the middle of your body with the square and you cross the middle of the body yeah. so that they're on top of each other. Let's try it. Ready, set, and go. <laughs> so what's going on imagine imagine a young child about to take their first step you know what that looks like the family's nearby usually and they're all cheering the child on and the child's standing there and they've never done this before it's new to them and to their brain they're wiggling they're wobbling they take that first step and it's almost always accompanied by <laughs> a mixture of emotions. And I do these brain games all over the world and there's a mixture of emotions within seconds. Why? Just like the young child, it's a new message from their brain to their legs. For most people, this is a new message. You know, I don't walk down the street and see AJ in Australia. I don't, I don't say hi like this. I'm hey, AJ, how you doing? We say hi like this, right? But what if we could find more ways that were new for our brain. What if we could elicit and ignite more synaptic connections? And by the way, the research is in. Yes, a young child's brain is more sponge-like, but at any age, at any age, we can create new connections. It takes a little more work, a little more intention, but it's possible. Let's do one more. Hand here, hand here. Oh, yeah. Just commenting, can we just put you on um, speaker view for a minute? Because they can see only the screen, one person's view. Oh, bigger screen? You got um, it. Just get rid of your um, 
screen that you're sharing for a minute. Yeah, just so that they can watch you. Sure, sure. So, so there are there's over 320 of these. And we've created, it is an online, online resource. And I can talk about that later if you want me to, AJ. I mean, that's not why I came here. But basically, the, 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 uh, what, what's going on is we want to, in, in general, cross from this side of the body to this side of the body. So, and it can be any body part. So it could be shoulder. And then this hand could go to any body part on the other side. So ear. Let's try that. Shoulder and ear. Two, three, and switch and switch, switch, switch. So what I've done is I've scaffolded them from the simplest, right? The next one after that for young children is this one. But many young children will do this. Why? Because it's easier. Now you'll notice the one for adults that I use a lot as a teaser, we're not even crossing, but we eventually we do. For some people, this is already very difficult. But empathy is a very important thing as a human being, right? So when we struggle with something like this, we then know what the child who's doing this feels like. Mm. Or we know how a new employee feels on their first week or month on a new job. Or we know how a new parent feels with that newborn. Or we know how someone who's struggling with depression and anxiety feels. We may not know exactly how that feels, depending on our uh, our experiences, but we can at least be more empathetic about it. So the basis of these brain games is essentially one body part, another body part, switch. And they get, let me show you one here. Yeah. Hand here and make a diagonal line. And remember, we're doing this to create new synaptical connections. The music that I'm, I've been using, we recorded ourselves. I'm a performing artist and conductor. It's, so, it's part of what I do. And this hand here is circle. So the music is a <laughs> the music is a specific frequencies and ready set and uh, change the direction of the circle. Okay. <laughs> and now we're going to switch arms. The one that's doing the diagonal line is going to become the circle. Keep it going. Oh no 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 no! Go back. Go where you were. Ready, set, and switch in time. <laughs> and if that's too easy. Make one fast and make the other slow. Ooh. Wicked, right? <laughs> yeah. So right. there is, and, and I, I'm not, I'm not making any judgment hmm. with anyone in the world. I, I'm just stating I wanted to share the idea that it's important to embody that which we want to become, learn, or strive to be. So whether it's a physical exercise, whether it's nutrition and, and experimenting with spirulina and lion's mane mushroom and in your smoothies, um, or whether it's a new brain game, or whether it's learning a new language, or whether it's um, introducing your palate to ferment, fer fermented foods, newness is critical to awakening the human spirit. Mm. The human spirit dies in the known. The human spirit thrives in the unknown. Mm. It thrives. And I'm speaking from experience. And I'll be honest, I, I, I didn't always have that intention. You know, life rolls around. Now I live life with a lot of intention, although I leave plenty of room for improvisation, which is another workshop. But so what do you think? Are there any other questions? Or AJ, what, what, do you have any questions right now before well, I continue? I love all this in particular, and I'm more than happy you to put your slides back up. It was just while we were doing some of those people needed to see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, cool. um, I know for me, I observe a lot of this and very much about the human spirit um, since my mother had a stroke last year. And so, you know, the right hemisphere of her brain severely impacted and her ability to move her left side impaired. And watching her neurologically form new pathways to overcome some of the challenges of her physicality and yes. watching, um, you know, the hospital kind of say that's about as good as it's going to get. But she's actually gone beyond that through playing some games and doing some things and even throwing a ball for her dog and yes. saying, throw it with your other hand and little things like that, how stuff started to come back. Yeah. 
those little things are big things. Mm. My mom had a stroke about 10 years ago, I think. Yeah. And she could not, this, this brain game right here was so hard, she couldn't do it. Yeah. Much less this one. So she's yeah, doing a lot dressed, better. Even, Pardon me? Even getting dressed in their clothes of a day becomes a challenge. Oh. Brushing her hair, she forgets to brush one side. Um, Nicola, who's watching, has just said that anything new is always scary and fearful for her. Maybe oh. you've got tips on how people can embrace that change a little more. Thank you for, what was her name again? Her name was Nicola. Uh, Nicholas? N Nicola? Nicola, yeah. Nicola. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, you're not alone, first of all. You're not alone. Uh, we're, we're talking about human beings. And we all experience fear at some level. I mean, has it, everything, most things that I've experienced in life live on a spectrum, right? And fear, like anything else, lives on a spectrum. So hesitation is a form of fear. It's, a, it's on the lower end of the fear scale. Whereas running for your life from a lion, that's a different kind of fear, right? Or fearing what people will think of us. That's a different kind of fear. Um, anxiety, it's not necessarily fear-based, but it's connected to the fear spectrum. So there are things we can do to overcome that. One of them is practicing, starting with things that are somewhat fearful, like these brain games, for example. Uh, you know, you, you, we all know we're not going to hurt ourselves. We know they're healthy for us, right? Um, we're not going to, we have very little to lose other than our maybe own self-dignity. <laughs> But if you're doing it in, in this kind of um, setting, no one's watching, right? So the fear level is probably a lot lower than in some other things. But here's the thing. Once we start to experience new things, like these brain games, for example, in a safe setting, over time, little by little, there's a thing called transference of knowledge and transference of experience. So your mind, your brain becomes more used to the idea of something new used to the idea of risk. Let me, let me just briefly, I would, I, so risk, how do we get to a point where we risk without fear? Whoa, right? That's a big part of awakening the human spirit. Let me back it up for you. If you make a circle, right? I wasn't gonna talk about this, but it came up for the, because of this great question. Yeah. To get to risk, we start with affirmation at the bottom of the circle, the cycle of growth. When we affirm others, and most importantly, when we affirm, who we are and who we're striving to be. When we affirm, when there's affirmation in our life, and if you didn't grow up with affirmation, it's okay. You can find people who will. You can find your tribe, right? So when affirmation is there over here, this part of the circle, then that allows us to trust more. When we are affirmed, we by default naturally trust more. Yes, in others, but most importantly, in ourselves. Right. Trust in our own ideas. When we have trust, then we begin to risk. Mm -hmm. And if it's new to us, it is scary. In 1997, I left a full-time uh, tenure track faculty position at the University of Arizona. I resigned. And I almost didn't. Why? Fear. I'm so glad I did. <laughs> because now I do all those same things, but more things, and I do them how I want to do them. Right? I still teach, but differently. And uh, yeah, so that, that's another story. But check out this slide based on, related to that question you asked. I want everyone watching to think, consider the idea. What if we could look at grief and adversity as an ally? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, the first time this was presented to me, I pushed back. I pushed back because I thought, okay, my friend, a brilliant friend of mine who you need to meet, Rick Waymer, international artist, director, actor, teacher, and he's one of my closest colleagues. And Rick asked me, have you ever thought about grief as an ally? And I thought, uh, no. Um, I thought about my mom and how she lost my youngest brother. Her, she lost her youngest son when he was 33. And I thought, yeah, sure. I'm going to go to my mom and say, hey, mom, it's OK. Adversity is your ally. <laughs> eh, I don't want to talk about it. She, you know, she, it was really obviously really difficult and, and for a long time and really to a certain degree still today, but she's doing a lot better with it. And we talk a lot about it today. She's ready to talk about this, you know, 11 years later. Right. So here's, 
adversity as ally is another session all of it all to itself it's several sessions all I, the reason i put it here is when we rewire our brain when we create healthy connections and more of them when we eat better when we begin to move all these different things that are connected we we interpret adversity differently. Um, I think I have a book, right? Yeah. So here's a book. I mentioned it earlier, Mindsight by Daniel Siegel. I know it's backwards. Mindsight by Daniel Siegel. Oh, okay. In this book, Mindsight, one word, by Daniel Siegel. Right. It's a must read. It's a must read. And he talks about a very interesting concept. He says, emotions are real, obviously they are. But we do not have to be our emotions don't have to dictate who we are or how we act. Our emotions, while real, are an activity of the brain, specifically the lizard brain, the brain, the brain stem, the old part of the brain, not, not the golden child brain, not, not right here, the prefrontal cortex, right? So read that book. It is possible. And these brain games, here are the four things. There are eight. Here are the four of the eight things that when these four things happen simultaneously, it is superfood for our brain. And I show this to you because a lot of brain games out there only do one or two, right? Frequency, I do that with music. It is the, a fun way to do it. Rhythmic consonants, when we're in time with the music. So dancing is a great thing. Is it good for your brain? Absolutely. So what do we do during this pandemic? Dance. Please go and dance today. Dance. I might have a salsa party. It's nighttime here. You know, it's, it's uh, 8.30 p.m. in Arizona right now. I feel like dancing salsa. I got dressed up just for AJ and everyone else watching today. <laughs> I took a shower at a time I never took a shower. It was fun. You know, rhythmic consonants when we're in time with the music, the temporal performance of the brain. The temporal performance of the brain kicks in without you even knowing it. So there's a lot of, of stuff here that, um, let's see, did I, oh, let me go back to the right slide and there it is, no worries. <laughs> so the other four things are right here. And this is from Daniel Siegel's book, Mindsight, that I just showed you. I'm referencing his book here. So the idea of practicing over and over again, the idea of being all in emotionally, the idea of something new and the idea of our focus at a different level. And this is what I've been doing. And I didn't realize that, I, I'm, again, the level of grat gratitude I have for my mom and my grandma. Because at, at four and a half years old, I went to my mom and I said, I want to play the piano. And my mom said, sure. And my mom and dad bought me a piano. So I'm 54. So for 53 and a half years, I've been playing the best brain game of all, the study of a musical instrument. There is no second, there's no close second. And I'm referencing research by a lot of big time folks. Um, the, the, they've taken PET and MRI brain scans and they see how the brain lights up and the number of new connections is outrageous when someone is studying a musical instrument on a daily basis, not just here and there, just to be clear. <laughs> so if you just pick up a violin, sorry, it takes a little more than that. <laughs> Oh, I know that. More. I've tried to take up guitar this year. I'm still oh. three chords. Still only have three chords, but yeah, it really yeah, yeah, yeah. my brain. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We, 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 I was going to do some more, but I'm looking at my time and I want to make sure we leave enough time for more questions. And, and I wanted to show you this slide. Um, one, it's another strategy. It's another strategy related to how to awaken the human spirit. And it's related to what do we really see? Like, what do we see? What do we notice? Do we observe? And do we really know what that word means? I, I used to think I knew what it meant. And I realized I didn't. Because I started mentoring with a gentleman named Dr. Carol Reinhardt, who was a contemporary of Fred Rogers, if you saw the movie with Tom Hanks. If you haven't, another must see, right? I gave you a must read book. Must see movie is the Mr. Rogers uh, um, story with uh, featuring Tom Hanks. And this gentleman was 78 when I started mentoring with him until his death at 92 and a half years of age. And um, he kept asking me the same questions. And he would want to meet really early. And I now am much more, I'm much better early in the morning, 
but really I'm a night person. So I, he would want to eat at 6 a.m. because he was up at 3 I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't say it. I met him. He's a legend. <clears throat> and the first question he asked me, AJ, was, when is the learner or employee or child, use whatever word you want, when is the learner most engaged? Why? What prompts it? And, and another question, and I, 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 get, I, I, meet, I quickly tried to answer the question. <laughs> another question, he had three big ones. One of the others was, when does the learner or child or employee, whoever, when is the parent, when is the learner, when do they build, when do they choose to build community? Why and what prompts it? And so I would describe what I thought community was and my definition back then was much more narrow than it is today. And the next time we got together, two weeks later, he asked me the same questions. I thought, oh no, I thought he was going senile. How do I get out of this? He wasn't the one that was senile. Oh dear. <laughs> I was, he was asking me the questions because my answers were crap. <laughs> my answers were garbage. He wasn't even looking for an answer. He was looking for a conversation. He was looking for better questions. And I thank him today because I finally realized and figured out how to stop falling in love with trying to find the answer. I fell in love with asking the question. That's powerful. So everyone just pause on that for a moment. Yeah. Yeah, I just think, yeah, not falling in love with getting the answer, but falling in love with asking the questions is super powerful. And I always say questions are the answer, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, to this day, here's the, here, to make it real, you know, because we, a lot of us, we like to live up here in this conceptual world and talk about these ideas. And I love, I live there about 50% of the time. I could live there more. And sometimes I do, depending on the setting. But then the other 50% of the time, I like to make it real. So to make sure everyone, that everyone feels invited. I don't want to lose anybody. Going, ah, what are you talking about? So let's talk about relationships for a quick second. Because relationships are, um, well, they're pretty important. <laughs> whether it be um, uh, partners who are living together, uh, or whether it be your father, or daughter, or mother, son, whatever it is, um, uncle, aunts, whatever it is. So you're looking at an image of my son. And I, you know, we all make mistakes as parents, but one of the things I've done a really good job of, I've been told <laughs> uh, by my amazing partner and wife, Marie, um, who's also a musician, she's a country pianist, um, is our kids still reach out. They're 26 and 22 now. And check this out. They still reach out to us, mostly by text and say, hey, we need to grab a cup of coffee together. For no part, for no reason. Now I don't know about you, but when I was 22, 24, 26, I loved my parents, but I wasn't reaching out to my parents to jam. I wasn't reaching out to my parents to have a cool sit down and jam about um, string theory or multiverse theory or you know some Joe Rogan podcast or you know what's AJ up to in Australia or whatever it is. And we, we, but my kids do. And one of the reasons I think is because I've learned to ask them, I, I don't make demands and I don't make statements. It's rare. I ask questions. I ask questions and questions lead to authentic dialogue and authentic dialogue is one of the key, another key thing we need to awaken the human spirit. And it comes back to what you were saying before about affirmation of self and others you know, that building of trust. And you were saying when we trust more, we risk more. And trust is built through those, that dialogue, isn't it? And going deeper and spending more time with people. We don't trust instantly. We trust through little grains of sand that are spent yes. over time in the depth and the question. So I love that. It, it, you're, AJ, that was a brilliant comment. It is definitely a journey. Uh, trust is a journey. It's not an event. <laughs> It's not an event. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> here's a quick story <clears throat> to give you an idea. This, in this picture, my son was uh, 21 years old. I, I was, pardon me, he was 20. And uh, he's 22 today. And when he was uh, three, if I were to ask my three-year-old Nick, my son, hey, do you, you want to play? Because I played with my kids. He would, he would, his typical reaction would have been like, yeah, let's play, dad. He didn't care what the game was. I mean, eventually he might've asked, but he wasn't like, how do you win? 
he just said, yeah, let's play. When he was 14, like most young teens and like many adults, we stop observing like young children. We stop living and playing like young children. We get serious. Um, you know, children, they'll see a pebble that has a slightly different shape and they notice that it's a slightly different shape. They'll notice a cloud looks like a rabbit. They'll notice a butterfly has different colors. But as we get older, we forget to observe. Like, I wonder how many people have observed what's behind me. I'm just curious. I wasn't, I, that just came up right now in my head. There's a Yaki dancer back there. There's a, a CD that's framed and there's this piece of original artwork, a friend of mine. But I wonder, I, I bet some of you probably have noticed it. And I bet some of there's probably were, oh yeah, I just noticed that now. Young children see all of that in an instant. My son at 14 stopped observing well. So I said, hey, you wanna play a game? And my 14 year old said to me, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and I said, okay, it's called uh, New and Who. He said, how do you play? Well, you gotta find something new you've never noticed before. So this is a strategy for all of you, okay? This is something that's a story, but a strategy. Love it. So he said, uh, I said, you gotta find something new. He said, what do you mean? Like anything, like at school, school, home, wherever, wherever. Like, what do you mean? Like, you might have seen something, but you haven't really paid attention to it. Okay. And then there's a second part of the game. He said, what's that? It's a question. I was just quiet. He said, what's the question? I can't tell you that yet or give the game away. Uh, and then my 14-year-old said, what a lot of older people say. How do you win? Wow. And I said, I can't tell you yet. It would give the game away. The reason I couldn't tell him is because the game, that game, this game, this strategy is not about winning. Mm. And we need to get out of this mindset of I'm going to win in a conversation or I'm going to win in this collaboration. You're already done. The moment someone is thinking like that, they're done. They might win temporarily, but they will not win long-term. And so he said, fine, I'll play. So I dropped him off at school that day. So here's how you play the game. And I said, hey, love you, blah, blah, blah. I said, hey, find something new. He said, okay, dad, bye. And I pick him up that day, 14 year old freshman in high school, gets in the car, I said, hey, how was your day, blah, blah, blah. Hey, so what'd you find that was new? Oh, dad, I forgot. So I pulled one of these, I'm driving. I, pull, I said, oh, you forgot? Oh, man. <laughs> and he's like, Wait. And we had a good relationship then, not like it is today. It's incredible today. Uh, I mean, but it was, it was good then. And he was like, anything? I said, yeah, anything. We live in the desert, mountainous, a lot of rocks, pebbles. He looks out the window and says, that rock, really? That's the best you can do? He said, dad, you said anything. I said, you're right. I did say anything. And then he remembered. He said, what's the second part? What's the question? Thanks for asking. Who are you? What? I said, who are you? He said, uh, Nick Feldman. I said, okay, cool. Is that what you were looking for, dad? I said, I don't know, was it? Oh, dad and his Yoda-like <laughs> existential question, you know, gave me a hard time. Ha, ha, ha. So we didn't play every day. It's not like homework. It's not, not like that. And then, uh, you know, he started noticing little things like a security camera. You know, we, we, the kind of conversation started very simple, but got a little better. And then I'd always say, who are you, Nick Feldman? One time I texted him, hey, have a great day at school. He texted back, hey, I noticed something really cool on the way to school or something interesting. I said, really? I didn't nudge him. I said, what was it? It was a yellow Camaro parked between on this corner of the street between these two businesses. I said, I wonder what's up with that. And he started talking about whether, you know, who could own it and why they part. He had a, a pretty long text. He thought about it. It's not the thing. It's how we do the thing. It's not the thing. It's not the learning vehicle. It's not the next, it's not the new, the newest next strategy. It's not the new curriculum, right? It's not the next motivational strategy. It's how we use them. Mm. And so he, he um, you know, he was cool. He was interested. And I said, by via text, and who are you? Nick Feldman. And about three months later, he comes home. And I didn't say anything. And he comes up to me really excited, like really excited. And said, dad, I noticed something really interesting today at school. I said, really, what was it? He said, when I asked, my friends in a group, a question, they very quickly come up with a consensus. They agree upon an answer. But when I ask them all the same question individually, they all have very different things to say. So we talked about peer pressure and social dynamics. It was a great conversation. 
And I started to say, who are you? But he interrupted me and said, you know, dad, if you were to ask me, what am I? I might have more to say. Inside, I'm doing backflips because Ooh. the learner, the employee, the parent, the child, they are taking over the framework and owning it. Yeah. But I, but I played it cool on the outside. I said, oh, okay, fine. Where are you? And my 14 year old six foot two son says to six foot dad, looking up my son, he says, I'm a carer. I said, what? A carer. You mean my caring? Yeah, I like to care for people. Wow. I, I had never heard my son say that before. The next time we played, he said, I'm a striver. Okay, note to self, you like to strive and you like to care. Wow. That's gonna help me help you, that's good. Fast forward to about nine months ago. We stopped playing, he's 14, you know, we stopped playing, 14. At age 22, okay, about nine months ago, I just think of the game and I text him and I say, hey, you wanna play you and who? And my 22 year old responds like a three year old. He says, what? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Ooh. So I, I let out, I let out. So I started, I said, um, I've noticed that the energy of morning light is very different from the energy of afternoon light. Mm -hmm. And my son says to me, oh yeah, that's cool dad. I noticed that back like when I was a senior in high school. <laughs> Thanks Nick. And then full circle, AJ, full circle. He says to me, what are you? <laughs> and two words came out of me that I had never, ever used. I, I didn't, I, I just reacted with my instinct. And two words came out of me that I never, ever used before to describe myself, which is pretty profound self-reflection. And I don't mean these words in any religious context or any, any kind of context. I just said via text, I said, I'm a healer and I'm an awakener. And my son says to me, and my son says, cool. <laughs> love it. Isn't that a cool story? I love it. And, and actually, people are, there's lots of liking going on on Facebook. Right. And Richard um, Clayton's just asked, what makes a great Christian? What makes a great Christian? Yeah. What a cool question. Exactly. For me, here's how to answer it. Um, and we all might have different answers and it's all good. It's all good. I would, I would say the same thing, which makes a great Christian is that for me, my, my opinion is the same thing, which makes a great human being, which is also the same thing, which makes a great Muslim or a great Buddhist. And I'm not trying to dodge a question. I really mean these words coming out of my mouth. So for me, a, a great Christian, like, like any human being, right? Are they loving? Are they compassionate? Are they open to other ideas? Are they always living with the intent to heal? Not, not, and I don't mean that in a commanding way. I mean, I mean being a healing person, uh, empath empathetic. So thank you for that question. That's a beautiful question. And, 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 uh, and some might think, wow, that's a kind of a bold question. And I, I totally am into it. So any questions at all? Um, I love like that a lot. And it reminds me a lot of Robert Greenleaf's definition of a good leader that is a servant leader. And it's, do people grow wiser, freer, more likely to become a leader? Are they expanded because of their interactions yeah. with you? And so in a similar way, a great question allows you to come alive, more free, expanded, all of those sorts of things. People are saying amazing story, by the way, Duan and uh, Melissa. Thank you, everyone. Oh, they're loving it, yeah. <laughs> I want to play a game with everyone since Great. everyone's interacting. So let's play a game together. Great. This is an, another strategy, right? So this strategy is will help you and everyone around you at any age, corporate. I've worked as a coach, speaker. I work in, in the corporate world, nonprofit world, you name it. And I've used this with three, four, and five-year-olds. I've used it with preschool teachers. I've used it with, at a lawyer convention, they needed some help breaking out of their box. And that was fun. So it, the game is called, what do you see? That's the game. So actually, let me go back to the previous image. And I'm gonna ask you a question. And in the chat box, let me get my laptop open here. In the chat box, I'd like you to, um, I'd like you to type what you see. Uh, never mind the words, just the image my son and myself. Ready, set, go. Just type in what you see. So people in Facebook land as well, what do you see? 
Yeah, what do you see? What do you see, AJ? In this image, I see water, I see stars, I see an angled photo. Good. I like angled photos. I see geometry, I, I see smiles, I see similarity in eyes and the shape of eyes, noses. Yeah. Dig, dig, dig a little. You're doing great. Dig a little deeper. What else? I do you see, I see connection. I see the way your shoulders are close so that you're trusting and close to each other. Ooh. I see the light behind your son's shoulder. And so I'm curious about what's outside. Um, I see his hairdo, which is very funky. <laughs> oh, man, I'm so jealous. His hair is his mom's hair. <laughs> it is like a shag carpet, baby, out of Austin Powers. I mean, right out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Other people are saying they see light, they see happiness, they see closeness, they see homeliness. Uh, people are saying they see a fireplace, they see love, they see joy, they see smiles, lots of smiles, light, um, fire, yeah. Okay, ready, set, and Go. What, do you what, do you see? See? what do you see? What do you see now, everyone? I won't jump in this time. I'll let everyone that's watching go first. Yes. Yeah. Type in what do you all see now? Uh, reaching out to the sky. Good. People are saying Facebook's just catching up because it's got a slight delay. People are saying sky, aspire, clouds. What else do you see, people? Reflections. Yeah. Pat saying dumb. She sees dumb. Trees. Oh, a dome, a dome. Oh, a dome, maybe is what she meant. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, Vicky's saying she sees confusion. Excellent. Someone else is saying, oh, Joe's saying nature and beauty. Hey, Joe. You know what I see? And th there's no right answer, by the way. Yeah. Spiral. No right, which is interesting. I see striving. I see soaring. I see yeah. uplifting. I, yeah. I see I, I see a human arm reaching up into the sky. Mm. Ready, set, and okay, what do you see? What do you what see? Do you see now? No. Adorable, I see. Adorable. <laughs> Someone said creativity. Um, so we'll just wait while Facebook land catches up because they are just on a slight delay. So what do you see, folks? What do you yeah. see in this next image? And you are looking at my daughter when she was about eight and my son when he was about four. Huh? Someone said they saw mischief. <laughs> Which mischief. one or is it both? Yeah. Sibling. Oh, yeah. People and siblings. So yeah. Cuteness. Yeah, there's a cuteness overload going on, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we're seeing force. We're seeing love, life, happy family, security, and that secure feeling. Oh, interesting. I, I did not see that. I, I see it now. I, uh, connectedness. I also see posed because I come from a family of photographers that had a studio. And so I know sometimes family photos were posed, <laughs> you know, like yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> you sit here, put your arm there, the hands folded. <laughs> yeah. So it's an, I play this with young children, with everyone, because what's really interesting is here's a question for all of you now. How often do we take the time to, to, to think in this kind of detail or, or to give this kind of thought um, mm. to the things we see every day in our life? Or do we just really kind of mm. not see it? Do we, do we, we know it's a sunrise. We know it's a sunset. We know it's a delicious piece of you know, salmon or, or it's a fantastic jackfruit taco, vegan, if that's what you do. We know it's an acai smoothie, but do we really take the time to really taste it? Mm. If we're going to awaken the human spirit, observational literacy is what I call this. Mm. Being literate in how we observe. And I love a couple of people just said they see protection and shielding too. Oh, which great is responses. Lovely. And here's, there. Yeah. and here's the thing. We're not, we're not trying to win, are we? No. We're no. all learning from each other. Mm. But we have to figure out concrete ways to help people wrap their, their linear adult brains 
which I'm not saying everyone here is that. I'm saying a large percentage of, adult, of adults in this world today are very much thinking in linear ways. Nothing wrong with that, but we need to balance it with um, abstract thinking. So it's, it's um, let me see here. There we which is the meeting of two, which is, you know, science and spirituality. It is left brain, right brain, isn't it? It's all of that intertwining and, and taking the beauty of both. It's also parent and child. Oh yeah. Bringing the connection. One, one last one, what do you see? I love this image. Oh, gorgeous. Right, isn't it? I see a future. Oh, no one's ever said that. Oh, that's a great response. Uh, walking in lockstep. Yeah, I see that in the chat room here. Mm. Wow, the future. What a great response, AJ. So we could go on and on and on, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, such a fun game to play. So um, the question there regarding progressing together. Thank you, Joe. Um, so, you know, in terms of what we sense, which is a little different than what we see. And I didn't ask what you all sensed, but you all went there naturally, which was a beautiful thing. That's what the game is meant to do. It's meant to help us go from seeing to sensing. You're looking at my daughter when she was not eight, but when she was four. Mm. Um, so I want to share a couple more things that I think will ignite some more conversation about the human spirit, awakening it, and how to live with purpose. And here's the thing that I want to share with everyone is um, for, for, from my experiences for, for myself, with my kids, with my colleagues, and the hundreds and thousands of people that I've worked with across the world, is it's the, the, same, the same things which awaken the human spirit are the same things which allow us to live with more purpose. In other words, when our brain, our mind, and our body, when we're optimizing it as best we can, mm. we create the environment possible to both awaken the spirit and begin to ask ourselves better questions, which eventually leads to, I should say it can lead to, there are so many variables. I couldn't possibly do it all in one session. It, it, it leads to being able to live a more purpose-driven life. So this is my daughter when she was four. And when she was four, she said to me, daddy, I'm tired of the books you're reading to me at night. And I said, really? Luckily, I didn't say, well, those are the only books we have, young lady. And I didn't say, where there are some people who have no books. You should be more grateful for the books you have. I didn't say that. I asked a question, a really simple question. I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to make our own stories. Oh. You never know what one question will lead to. Because wow. today, my daughter and I, very good friends, yeah, she, I mentor her, she mentors me. And together, we're co-authoring a series of books. So uh, I'm just showing these real quickly. And, and I'm, I'm not showing this to you because of the books, but because of what they represent. Yes. In these books, there are these little ants. And by book five, the one in the middle there, the, the one with the raindrop distorted, <clears throat> for the first time in the series, she, she's the lead writer, okay? And for the first time, we show the ants going through PTSD. Powerful. Now, why would we do that? Because my daughter, has gone through some really dark, dark experiences. And th there's, this is a happy ending. Um, so if this triggers you at all, just know briefly, I'm not gonna show the whole story, we don't have time for it, but my daughter gives me permission to share this story. And my daughter is also a speaker and shares this story publicly. So um, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I'm gonna give you the, the 411 here pretty quickly. So these books are all about perspective and curiosity and, and transformation as a byproduct which is something I want you all to think about. I hear a lot of people sometimes talking about transformation as a goal. Nothing wrong with that, cool goal, great goal. I have found more success in transforming myself and helping others transform themselves by looking at transformation as a byproduct. A byproduct of what? Of exactly what you've experienced today. Embracing new perspectives. Today we did that with brain games, right? Ignite curiosity. Today we did that with what do you see? And it created this great vibe, even online, even online, right? So um, the real quick story, I know I got like two minutes. So my daughter is the girl who lived and my daughter is also the woman who creates and leads. My daughter is a complete badass. I mean, she's incredible. 
And um, so when we started with these books, check it out. At age 21, my daughter said to me, um, we, were we were writing book one, and I said, um, I kept referencing Sam Dan as a he uh, without thinking about it. And my daughter called me on it and said, why does the main character always have to be a male? Yeah. I said, it doesn't. it doesn't. That's just me saying words without thinking about it. I apologize. And I didn't say but or however. I just said, my bad. I messed up. We, Sam Deanne can be a girl. And she said, no, dad, you don't get it. I said, help me out. What don't I get? She said, why can't we let the reader choose? Well, what do you mean? We use no pronouns in the English. OK. Yeah. So there are no pronouns in the English. The Spanish, different game, right? And so, I mean, who does that, right? I mean, so I'm learning from her. Everything I really know about equity, I know through my daughter. This image is when she was in, about to go to college. And in all these pictures right here, my daughter looks really happy, right? Yeah. In all these pictures, uh, the, the one on the left with mom by the beach, Miami Beach, and the one graduation, those two for sure, she was still struggling profoundly from depression and from anxiety. Mm. And without going into all the details, my daughter, uh, she, she attempted suicide at age 19. She's 26 today. And when she attempted to take, when she took the bottle of pills her freshman year at the University of Arizona, she heard a voice in her head. And the voice she heard in her head was my voice. This is her story. She heard my voice and the words she heard was the childhood mantra I had used all my life with her. My Nana said to me, everything you touch turns to gold. And what I said to my kids was, you're a champion. You're a champion. And she took the bottle of pills and in her head, she heard, you're a champion. And she called out for help. So I share that with you because I think it's really important we go to these places because as human beings, we are, none of us are, um, none of us are exempt from fear. None of us are exempt None of us go through life without challenges. As a young kid, I had no challenges. I didn't have anything until my experience with my daughter. And there's more to the story. I can tell it someday in full, if you ever want me to, if it's appropriate, if, if it's needed. But my daughter today is all there. And in her own, and my daughter's a skeptic. I'm the, I'm the golden lab. I'm the optimist. My daughter's a skeptic. And in her own words, she said, I, my anxiety and depression are almost completely eradicated. Now, quickly, how do we do that? With love alone? No. She tried everything. None of it worked. What worked was getting her gut health right. And I don't have time to go into that today, but a big part of the waking the human spirit is healing the human spirit. Absolutely. Got to heal it. Mind yeah, so connection, you know, food and mood go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah. That is a beautiful story to share. And, you know, we appreciate you and your daughter being open enough to share that. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I know we're up against the clock here. I'm going to end with this slide here. And it's, um, these are the three words I use. You can use any word you want. I used to say I'm grateful. I used to have a goals list, AJ. I changed it to my gratitude list. And next to each goal, I wrote down exactly emotionally how I felt having achieved it already. Mm. And then I switched from saying I'm grateful and a daily mantra that I use is I am gratitude. Mm. I'm love. I am champion. For me, when I do a lot of yoga, when I breathe in, I breathe in the energy of gratitude from all the people, partnerships, and, and projects in my life. And it comes to me. Right, abundance. And then I am love, I send it back out to all those same people, projects and partnerships. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. I just thought I'd end and share that personal note of, of how I, oh, uh, thank you, Joe. <laughs> Very sweet of you. Um, and, and Duane are saying they love it. Yeah, uh, people are saying they love your work. And, uh, you know, I find it deeply touching and maybe we could all breathe in gratitude and breathe out love for a moment. Let's do it. You want to lead? Yeah. Or do you want to? Okay. Um, so here, here's how I do it. So I, I like to emphasize the words a little differently. I like to say, I am gratitude. I am gratitude. I am gratitude. Let's try it together. Ready, set, right. and go. I, I am gratitude. gratitude. I am, am 
Gratitude. Gratitude. I am gratitude. Gratitude. Next one. I, I am love. I am, I am love. love. I am love. I am love. <laughs> Last one. I, I am champion. Champion. I am champion. champion. I am champion. champion. And then yeah. take a deep breath. Yeah, and do a deep, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath into your nose, out your mouth. This time silently as you breathe in, breathe in gratitude from all good sources and then breathe out love back to those sources. Here we go, ready, set. One more. And with that, I left a link in the chat room um, in, in the Zoom. Um, I'll put it in Facebook land too. But I just want to thank you, AJ, and your team for all the work that you have, you know, I mean, it take, this takes a lot of work to put this together. So thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I think everyone is probably feeling the blessings. Feel free to share in the chat box if you're loving this. Um, what a great way to round out our third speaker. So please also join me in a round of applause. Everyone's saying fantastic to you, Enrique, for your sharing today and just the breadth and the um, amount of stuff you've shared today has been phenomenal. Um, he's just posted um, a link. Uh, Pat Armistead just posted a link as well for people to watch. Oh, which was We Are The Champions. Awesome. Um, also, Michelle posted a link below about how you can join our superhuman experience, which comes up after the summit as well. So we encourage people to go and have a look at that link as well. But please... Join me in a virtual round of applause for Enrique. Go and visit his um, authentic purpose movement and everything he's doing online. We love, love, love your work. Thank you. Many blessings from Australia across to Arizona over there. Blessings back to you, Australia. Thank you so much. <laughs> and everyone, if you are ready in an hour's time, join us again. And my co-host, the beautiful, delicious Michelle, will be on in her red cape. And she is going to be talking to Anuraj Gambir who we had in um, the first summit as well. So be um, on that in the next hour. And then we've got Casey Warwick, Alexis Sneaky, and Jeff Marlowe. So lots more to come today on day one of the Science and Spirituality Superhuman Summit. Loved having this session. It was amazing and um, be well, everyone. Keep breathing in gratitude, breathe out love. <laughs>